This is part two of Middle Childhood, and we're going to talk first about special children's special needs. And we're going to start off talking about gifted children. Gifted children, everyone thinks that uh, uh, gifted children have all the advantages, they don't need services, but that is not an accurate assessment because gifted children have um, a whole set of issues all of their own. Um, the definition of giftedness is not only a high IQ score, but can include a talent in a specific area. Um, this could be art, music, dance, and when you have an exceptional talent, that talent needs to be nurtured. Um, we do not want that child's talent to um, wither but to flourish so gifted children tend to be more mature sometimes it's more difficult for them to relate to other people uh, certainly other children of their own peer group um, they very often relate better with adults than their peers um, as adults they actually state that they're happy with their jobs their lives their relationship and a lot of this giftedness is uh, has a relationship to creativity. So let's talk about the difference between, between creativity and intelligence because um, there is a difference between them. And if you remember from intro, we talked about creativity uh, in intelligence is thinking outside the box, having novel solutions to problems, using creativity to solve problems. So um, let's first start by talking about intelligence. So intelligence is associated with convergent thinking. And it's important that you know the definition of convergent, which is using information to determine a standard correct answer. Okay, so uh, we had talked also in uh, intro about fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. And I want you to think of convergent thinking as being that crystallized intelligence, having the ability to know the capitals of all 50 states. It's a standard correct answer. In contrast, creativity uses divergent thinking in which the aim is not a single correct answer, right? Often there isn't one, but instead you're thinking in novel and unusual directions. And if you remember that that is fluid intelligence. Um, and so creativity must be cultivated, okay? It must be cultivated. And of course, uh, being able to think outside the box and be uh, divergent in your thinking can get you better results. Uh, certainly it is important to uh, have convergent thinking, yes, uh, but if you can combine the two, convergent and divergent, and use fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence, it will benefit you greatly. Um, as people get older, uh, the elderly, and obviously we haven't covered the elderly yet, uh, their fluid intelligence decreases, but their crystallized intelligence can still go strong. So when my mom says that she can't learn to use a t cell phone, I, I know that she really can if she really wanted to. So... Um, so, uh, so that is, we're not going to cover intelligence. We covered that in intro about intelligence testing, um, and you won't be quizzed on it. Now we're going to turn to, uh, children with an intellectual disability. And, uh, this refers to substantial limitations in intellectual ability as well as problems adapting to an environment with both. And this emerges before the age of 18. Now, 
Uh, in the current diagnostic manual, the DSM-5, uh, there is a twofold uh, criteria to be met to have a diagnosis of an intellectual disability and I personally am glad for it. It's not just about the number, the number 70, which back in the day, uh, I can't even say it, uh, but it was just the number would give you the diagnosis for an intellectual uh, disability, but also uh, adapting to the world around you, life skills, uh, that comes into play, uh, because certainly we understand that some uh, children with an intellectual disability have uh, higher adaptive skills, higher life skills. Some can ride a bike, some uh, could have a higher number but not be able to ride a bike. So it just varies differently uh, to each child and it needs to be taken into consideration. So uh, so that's, that's great, I think. So um, Let's talk about some of the factors that place children at risk, at risk for an intellectual uh, disability. And you'll remember from intro us, uh, or not from intro, from human growth and intro, talking about teratogens and how uh, biological uh, factors can affect uh, a child uh, and environmental and uh, medical for sure. So let's start off talking about biomedical. Um, biomedical could be a chromosomal anomaly, uh, malnutrition, a traumatic brain injury, a teratogen that gets through the placenta, um, a social factor could be poverty, impaired parent-child interaction, uh, abuse, trauma, um, behavioral could be child neglect. Um, um, again, to me, that's also part of social domestic violence abuse. All right, it's categorized under behavioral. Certainly, uh, watching something or being physically abused is going to have a social and a behavioral impact on a child. Educational, you could have impaired parenting, um, sport, poor special education services can uh, make a difference. Uh, we talk about nature via nurture. Certainly a child in a much more uh, enriched environment is going to have better outcomes than in an impoverished environment. Uh, no individual factor necessarily leads to an intellectual disability. Uh, you still could see domestic violence. It doesn't mean that you're going to have a, an intellectual disability, but of course that risk will grow the more factors that are involved. Okay, so um, a learning disability which is a separate category, is that is a child with a normal intelligence. Now you remember from intro, i got to keep you up with it, uh, you know, your range was uh, 15 uh, points above and 15 points below, you know, one standard deviation off of 100, so you would have a range of 85 to 115. So a child with a learning disability has a IQ score within that normal range, um, but what they have is difficulty mastering at least one academic subject. All right, and there's no other conditions involved with this. This is not related to anything else. So 5% um, of students at school are classified as having a learning disability and developmental dyslexia is the most common um, and that is difficulty learning to read, uh, fluency and with accurate uh, comprehension problems dis distinguishing sounds in written and oral language. And those of you who've had me in person know that I have a little dyslexia. Very often when I'm writing on the board, 
I flip those letters around and hey I just keep going at it and I know you guys will tell me when I reverse them I always look at it and go what uh, but uh, so that is just a, a problem now of course uh, when it comes to a learning disability and having a language impairment you know that of course is going to affect math because math is language a language impairment affects every subject that you have part of a learning disorder uh, is or can be processing um, many students that I've had over the year have uh, years have had processing deficits and so they process information differently than the rest of us and uh, that uh, creates uh, a lot of issues for them so you can have auditory and visual processing deficits uh, certainly all of these different types of learning disorders can affect one's uh, psychological perspective their self-esteem um, their self-concept um, and so along with working with the actual disorders you have to work on the psychological and social impacts of the disorder uh, there are many schools that are available for students with learning disabilities uh, as long as they a lot of them you cannot have a behavioral issue uh, and of course uh, that would not there are some cases where there may be behavioral issues uh, due to a learning disability uh, we do have a few schools for students with intellectual disabilities and I'm talking about private schools in both these categories uh, but the majority of students uh, are uh, treated uh, through their public school system so um, let's move on to our last category which is ADHD attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, and three to five percent of children are diagnosed with ADHD and boys outnumber girls three to one it is a neurodevelopmental disorder and it has three components which are hyperactivity which you know is uh, being overly energetic fidgety can't keep still and it has a in attention aspect to it uh, and an impulsive aspect to it which is uh, not thinking before acting so um, this is a a disorder which people do not grow out of they have it throughout the course of their life as with the rest of these disorders um, and what we use to treat ADHD is stimulants as you already know uh, so these drugs stimulate the parts of the brain that normally inhibit hyperactivity and impulsivity behavior and what happens is the stimulants actually calm those areas so uh, people with ADHD have a low arousal threshold and it needs to be compensated with increased stimuli so uh, and of course no surprise psychosocial treatments are used as well uh, the last part of this lecture that we're gonna touch on is the phys physical development of uh, the middle childhood and so let's review some of this and um, and then that will be the end of part two of the lecture so um, physical growth goes at a steady rate until 12 years old uh, children gain about eight pounds and two inches a year most of the increase is in height and that increase comes from the legs not the trunk uh, girls hit puberty earlier at the end of elementary school and at about 11 or 12 girls are about a half an inch taller than the boys um, obviously it goes without saying a balanced meal good nutrition uh, is critical to uh, the development of a middle childhood uh, a middle child middle child uh, so fine motor skills improve children gain much more control 
over their fingers and hands. They're better at their handwriting. They're better uh, if they were playing the piano, better at puzzles, better at drawing. There are differences in the motor abilities between genders. Girls are better at fine motor skills. Back in the colonial times, they'd have girls doing needlepoint for that. And boys, they're better at gross motor skills, strength, and they can uh, jump and run faster. Uh, and so uh, kids are better now. They're better physically fit now. Um, but uh, we've had, I don't know if you guys remember, I don't even know if you did it, we used to have the President Physical Fitness Award, which we would do every year, and this is in the 1960s, uh, and uh, only half today meet the standards of the President Physical, President's Physical Fitness Award. Uh, there has been a 43% decline in results over the past decades. So we need to encourage sports, get rid of less calories, get rid of sugary drinks, um, and uh, get outside and play. This is the end of part two, and I will see you next time for part three.